Today we're going to be diving very deep into some of the most important foundations of Bleach's world. The nature of the cosmos, not just its history, but the design and features of this world are things that will inevitably crop up in any future video I want to make regarding Bleach's lore. The lore is very deeply interwoven into various other elements of the story, namely the characters and how they interact. The original sin from a million years ago is what defines existence in the current day, and thus it has a significant impact on how we engage with various things in the story. I want this to be a video that can serve as a strong baseline so that in future videos when I talk about some of the more abstract confusing topics there is a good point of reference a foundation that I can refer to when discussing things that require an understanding of the fundamentals. The approach Kubo takes with regards to exploring his world can be very esoteric and character centric. We know what the characters tell us and this is presented in various ways. Kubo never uses the classic omniscience narrator. Information is always given to us by the characters, many of which either have ulterior motives or are varying levels of ignorance about the truth. Kubo never gives us clear-cut answers, we always get point of views, like the Shinigami point of view on the Quincy Massacre which they themselves carried out. There is no shortage of unreliable voices and our main protagonist has an incredibly complicated relationship with the supernatural world. Think about this, we properly learn what an Asauchi is in the final arc of the story, even though it's the most essential aspect of the Zanpakuto power system, something that is present since the very first chapter. The Asauchi is mentioned during the Soul Society arc by Ichigo's inner Quincy spirit, and this is a great example of unreliable information as Old Man Zangetsu is literally lying in this moment. What he gives Ichigo is not an Asauchi, it's a blade he constructed from Reishi, which is what all Quincy weapons are. Because our protagonist is a character who is born in the dark, who knows very little about his own origins, let alone other people and the way the world works, and who also has this bizarre, incredibly unique relationship with the special world, the information we receive on certain key mechanics are often presented in vague and ambiguous ways. Bleach progressively peeling away at what is perceived to be possible and introducing crazy, impossible concepts is a key aspect of its identity. Many of the mechanics of the universe can be twisted and broken, and as we come to learn, this is because all of these things are ultimately just constructs with boundless potential. The world as it is today was designed in a specific image by specific people whose will has been carried on into the present by the monk who truly sits atop heaven's throne. Although I've already made an entire world building series exploring a lot of this already, let's very quickly take a look at some of the basics of the world, the main terminology that crops up again and again. Reishi, or spirit particles, is the stuff that makes up all spiritual existence. The best way to understand this is through its human world counterpart, both in the story and in our world, which is Kishi, best described as atomic particles. Kishi can be directly converted into Reishi, and we know that the properties of Reishi can be manipulated as a substance because Askin's death dealing allowed him to do just that, among various other examples. Reishi is really just Kishi at a higher energy state. It is not fundamentally different in composition or behavior. The key difference between Reishi and Kishi is that the primary building block is a spirit particle and not an atomic particle. Reryoku, or spiritual power, is the latent energy of each individual spiritual entity, obviously composed by Reishi, and this is where Shinigami and Hollows draw power from for their abilities. Since technically everything, even inanimate objects, have souls, everything has at least some reryoku, and it can be manipulated in various different ways. Reyatsu, or spiritual pressure, is just the force or pressure created by reryoku on the surrounding environment. Like I said, I've made a video going more in depth explaining these ideas, but for today, I specifically want to place extra attention on Tereishi. Every realm, with the sole exception of the human world, is a construction of Reishi. As such, every dimension in the cosmos contains a remyaku, or spiritual pulse. This is a latent energy field present in the human world, Soul Society, Hiwakomundo, the Soul King's Palace, and presumably Hell, although the amount of energy present obviously varies depending on the realm. You can think of this as the spiritual atmosphere, which is slightly different for each dimension. Even the human world contains reishi in its atmosphere, even though it's a construction of kishi, and that's why it has a much weaker remyaku than the rest. 
exist. Reishi is the primary building block of all spiritual existence. It makes up all souls or kompaku and it makes up the environment these souls inhabit. Kompaku are spiritual bodies that every life form possesses, including the hollows, although their kompaku takes on a different shape. Shinigami stay in their kompaku bodies, which is why the gigai exists for when they spend time in the human world and need to interact with its inhabitants. The usage of the term soul in Bleach can sometimes be confusing because there are two types of souls, the metaphysical kokoro as it's termed in various important junctures of the story or the ethereal soul and then the kompaku spiritual bodies or the corporeal soul if you will. The kokoro is a spiritual thing, it's literally just like how the concept of the soul is viewed in the real world, it's a formless thing that many people believe exists in a reality beyond our perception, beyond what we can see. However in Bleach we know for a fact it exists, it is located within the center of every spiritual body's chest, with the exception of the hollows, although that's an interesting topic we'll be talking about in the future. This page captures that quite well I think. Ichigo is literally traveling into his kokoro, the inner depths of his soul, and this inner world's appearance matches his feelings. When he's sad, it rains. Because of his misguided understanding about his own self, his world is inverted. When the inner world crumbles in Ichigo's first trial, it becomes the countless boxes that represent his spiritual power or reryoku, with his zanpakuto being contained in one of these boxes. Every single kompaku has a metaphysical soul of their own, however the ability to access an inner dimension seems to be something only the shinigami possess. On that topic, many people seem to be confused on what constitutes a shinigami. It's honestly pretty simple. Reryoku. Shinigami are pluses, or dead humans, with higher than regular levels of spiritual power. The best way to view the Shinigami is as some kind of mutation, an evolved form of kompaku. This mutation is probably why stronger kompaku, those who have the potential to be Shinigami, go hungry while other souls in the Rokongai never need to eat. It's also probably how the Hakusui and Saketsu are unsealed, which is what physically separates the Shinigami from other regular pluses whose supernatural organs lie dormant. Humans are living souls that reside in material bodies, bodies made of atomic particles or kishi, that is connected to a kompaku by a chain of fate. This is why there's such a drastic difference in the rate of aging between humans and kompaku. It's atomic particles versus spiritual particles. Their organs themselves are composed of reishi, which is higher energy than kishi, and that is reflected in how long they can live. It's also fair to assume then that incredibly powerful people like say Unohana can age at even slower rates because because of their extremely high amounts of reryoku which is channeled into their bodies. That being said, slower aging can be seen in all kompaku, even just regular pluses who wouldn't have much reryoku don't seem to age much since the time of their death in both the human world and soul society itself after the console ritual has been performed and they await reincarnation within the Rokongai. Onohana's comparatively slow aging could just be simply tied to her role as captain of the healing division, a similar case to Tsunade from Naruto. This child, Chad Meets is over 50 years old because he died young and hasn't aged very much at all since then. We can't quantify the rate of aging by any means since we simply don't know enough, but the fundamental reason for this difference lies in the fact that kompaku are a construction of reishi, whereas humans lie in bodies of kishi. The same applies to the Quincy, who we see in both kishi and reishi bodies over the course of the story. When they are in the human world, they operate within bodies of kishi and thus age at normal human rates. However, However, when they are in the Shatemberech, the shadow of the soul society, they can live for several hundreds of years and age at much slower rates because they now reside in bodies of Reishi. Cases like Yugaram and Bazbi, who don't seem to have aged at all in the last 1000 years, were probably frozen in time with Yuhaba in some way. I'm praying the Thousand Year Blood War anime shed some light on that because Quincy timeline stuff gives me an absolute headache. However, that's the difference that comes with Kishi bodies versus Reishi bodies. Everybody has a metaphysical soul containing within a physical soul in the form of a reishi body. Regular humans, in essence the spiritually unaware, reside in bodies of kishi never knowing about their reishi bodies until they die, which in the world of Bleach is literally the separation of a kishi body from a reishi body, at least for humans. Once the chain of fate is unattached, a human meets their fate and dies. And so you can also think of this as the difference between life and death, as the shinigami are the living dead. Existence as we know it in the current day conforms to a set 
set of principles. At the heart of it, there is balance. There's a flow of souls between the different dimensions that is governed and maintained by the Shinigami, an intentionally designed cycle of Reishi specifically flowing between the fixed shapes of life and death. This world came about because of five primordial beings and their varying motives that all came to the same conclusion to split the world, to escape the chaos and bring about order. And there is order in the current day, to a questionable extent for sure, but order nonetheless. And that is not something that can be said for the state of existence in the primordial age. The official translations of Can't Fear Your Own World state that had things gone on as they were, all of existence would have been reduced to one gigantic menos and the entire world would have come to halt. But the fan translations of Can't Fear Your Own World state that this had actually happened and that the Soul King's first act in existence was to slay that gigantic Menos. Either way, whether it was one gigantic Menos or an army of hollows, they were slayed by the Reo. This resulted in a ceaseless supply of Reishi sand that was later used to construct Hueco Mundo. The first Soul King is a being that was conjured up by the universe as a response to its impending collapse, a near omniscient, near omnipotent creature that would go on to be recognized as both a devil and a savior. Ichibe states that others, including himself, also began to spawn. Powerful beings with ridiculous abilities and high amounts of spiritual energy started to show up. But the Soul King was something else, even more extraordinary than the likes of Ichibe, whose power seems to know no bounds. I've spoken about the original sin and how exactly it went down far too many times on this channel, so I won't explain every detail of it today because returning viewers are probably sick of hearing it. The ancestors of the five great noble families split the world into separate realms that they would go on to govern as balancers and would later be known as Shinigami. Even though the Reo knew he would be mutilated and sealed within this crystal in this suspended state between life and death for over a million years, he intentionally did not resist against the ancestors of the great noble families. And I sincerely doubt it was because he had seen no future where it was avoidable like Ichibe suggests. This is a being with power unlike anything else in the story. Ichibe's other suggestion that the first Soul King may have detected some kind of hope in the new world is the more likely of the two. The power of the Almighty itself is what was used as the linchpin for the creation of the cosmos. The five great noble ancestors specifically needed Reo for the power of his eyes. That is how they created the current world as we know it, the separate realms, the cycle of life and death. And it is through this same power of the Soul King that Yuhaba intended to revert the world back to what it once was, which he had originally planned to accomplish by simply killing his father. Mimihagi's intrusion is what forced Yuhaba to absorb the Soul King and thus become the second Soul King, now acting as the cornerstone of the very world he wishes to destroy. Yuhaba's own almighty wouldn't have been capable of performing the feat, hence why he needed to take his father's power. Eyes obviously have religious connotations in various contexts. The all-seeing gaze of God is very much the idea Kubo is pulling from by making them the ultimate power of the series. This obviously manifests most significantly in Yuhaba, who becomes becomes fate itself through his usage of these eyes. He can alter the near future by imposing any of the near infinite futures reflected on his eyes onto the present, which he showcases on numerous occasions. However, the distinction between the three pupils in Yuhaba's eyes and the four in the Soul King's eyes is noteworthy, especially considering the attention placed on Yuhaba gaining an extra pupil when activating the Almighty against Ichibe. Going from two to three is a big deal, which suggests going from three to four is at least least equally significant. What could the Reo possibly see that surpasses Yuhaba's ability to observe all possible futures? To me, the most likely case is that time itself is perceived as a flat circle by the Reo. The future has already happened. The past is still going to happen. Everything happens simultaneously in the gaze of the Soul King. This is supported by the chapter sketches which depict the Soul King as a sphere or a grain of sand that signifies fate. Aizen tried to assume the role of fate within many people's lives, but he was a false deity, but a reflection on the water. Many things were coincidences that he simply adjusted to. He was driven by curiosity more so than he lets on, and his plans very often failed. Yuhabal was different. Where Aizen failed, he succeeded, time and time again. He was much closer to the real deal. His eyes gave him power over the future itself, not just the perceived reality of his victims. The effects of his power were very real.
real, not false and illusory like Aizen's. The way he bestows shrifts is similar to how Aizen uses the Hōyoku as a wish-granting jewel, but for Yuhaba this is a natural power while Aizen had to turn to scientific means to create the Hōgyoku, steal Urahara's for his wasn't sufficient alone, and even use a fragment of the being he detested most to create his Hōgyoku. But even Yuhaba, who is much closer to the real deal than Aizen, failed to understand himself and thus could not see all. The first Soul King is without a doubt the real deal. The world as we know it today was created using the Soul King as its canvas. He doesn't just represent the source of life, he is what life is modelled from. Although life in the form of hollows and presumably other types of sentient spiritual beings existed before he was conjured up by the universe to fight back against total collapse, when this being was carved up and sealed into that crystal, the ancestors of the great noble families turned him into the source of life. Absolutely everything comes from him, with the only exceptions being Hell, the oldest of the realms, and Ichibe, who seems to be the only being who outdates the current world. As the most powerful thing in existence, Reo was forced into becoming a god against his own will, using his own power that was also stolen from him by the Shinigami. At least, that's how the story seems, but as I mentioned, the Soul King had more than enough power to easily thwart their plans if he so wished. He, for some inexplicable reason we will definitely cover in the future, allowed it to happen. But very few people know of the Soul King's existence, and absolutely nobody, including us, knows the full story. What we have is Ichibe's rendition of the events, and I don't think I need to explain why he isn't the most reliable narrator. We obviously have unquestionable proof of the original sin in the Ryo's appearance, however the finer details we've only ever received from Ichibe, a man involved in that sin himself. Aizen only knew the story on paper, and learning the truth of the world, even without the finer details we have, was enough to set him on his quest of ascension to a higher plane and give birth to many of the philosophies he claims to hold. He scorns trust because he views it as a product of cowardice, a kind of incessant liability. Trust is a burden placed onto superior beings and Reo, as the quintessential being, was relied on by being stabbed in the back to take existence on to the next stage. So Reo is the ancestor of everyone as we know it, and I believe that includes the Hollows. This is more of a theory slash interpretation because we cannot say for sure, but I believe the Hollows of the primordial world are a separate thing to the Hollows of the current day. The way the soul works, the pipeline from Kompaku to Hollow, the circulation of souls that exists within the current world, is something that seemed to have been designed by the great noble ancestors using Reo's power. As such, the state of the world back then most certainly had an influence over how they chose to design things, which is why the Hollows of today most likely do bear a strong resemblance to the Hollows of old, however with the content we may potentially receive in the future, whether it be from the Helarch or Data Books or Club Kubo, I expect there to be some key differences as well. Perhaps we have already seen Primordial Hollows in the form of these guys from the Hell one shot, since they reside in the only dimension that outdates the rest of the world. On that note, another unknown detail is the degree to which the Shinigami have been affected by Ryo's existence. If his power was used to create the life cycle, the Kompaku being with the potential to become either a Shinigami or a Hollow must have come from him, right? Which means the Shinigami of today, the Quincy of today, the Hollows of today, and the Forbringers of today all share a common source, and this is reflected best through their powers. So the world as we know it today was constructed very deliberately, however there are probably just as many coincidences in the makeup of the cosmos as there are intentional design choices. The point, after all, is that this world was designed by five people with varying goals and beliefs that came to the same conclusion, to split the world. These were not gods. They were powerful, sure, but it's very likely much of that power came from the Reo himself in some way. They began to spawn into existence shortly after him, and I doubt they had a perfect blueprint for how they would fashion this world. The Quincy, for example, were possibly never in the original plans of the great noble ancestors. When did they even come into existence? The Quincy are Kompaku that contain a piece of Yuhaba within them, and Yuha was born in the human world. We don't know what brought him into existence, however, 
with the very clear references to biblical narratives of the Virgin Mary and how Yuhaba was conceived, especially with Kortu's anime edition, I think it's fair to assume what Kubo is going for is that some part of Reo's will manifested in Yuha, and the Quincy, the children of Yuha, are really the children of the Soul King. I am aware there is a strong possibility that Quincy existed before Yuhaba, however like I said, Quincy timeline stuff gives me a headache and that's something I hope to cover in the future when I have a better grasp over things. Reo's left arm Panaida, who represented progress, sided with the Quincy, and Reo's right arm Mimihagi, who represents stagnation and another aspect of Reo's will, sided with the Shinigami. Both of these beings, or at least what they represent, is contained within the Soul King. Ironically, the Quincy's case was to reveal convert the world to one of stagnancy, whereas the Shinigami, who fight for balance and to maintain the shapes of life and death, fight for the potential of progress. The sands of Reishi that were left behind from the hollow or hollows that Reo killed were used to create Hueco Mundo. The Garganta and Valley of Screams are other examples of things that probably just happened without having been exactly planned. The world's design is far from perfect, that's literally the premise of the one-shot chapter. The Garganta in particular is an endless chaos of Reishi that blankets and encompasses every single realm. It exists in all of them. The Garganta is used for travel in the realm of Soul Society multiple times during the final arc. People get confused sometimes because it's presented very similarly to the Dangai, but the Dangai is just a pathway built by the Shinigami between the Soul Society and the world of the living. In fact, these two realms seem to be very closely linked in other ways, with this line from Tatsuki implying that she could sense Orihime's spiritual pressure when she was in Soul Society but not Hueco Mundo, which is not as closely linked. In fact, I'm pretty sure Kubo stated that the Soul Society and World of the Living are parallel worlds, but I can't remember exactly where. The Dangai is basically a tunnel, or a corridor, connecting these two worlds and floating within the Garganta like every other realm. And probably before they invented the Sankaimon for easier travel to the World of the Living, the Shinigami used the Dangai for passage between the realms, and it was also a place of exile. That's why the Koryu and Kototsu exist. Kototsu is described as a creature of reason that cannot be destroyed by spiritual pressure, and it is carried by the Koryu, which is a current that is constantly flowing through the Dangai. Kototsu also governs and controls time and space. This was stated in the data book Unmasked. So this is essentially the god dog of the Dangai, which is specifically mentioned by Yuhaba as one of the areas Reo has domain over, and we know that being chased by the Kototsu has shown to lead to a time distortion. The purple ectoplasmy appearance of the dimension also slightly reminds me of the gates of hell. This is purely headcanon for now, but the human world was created to serve as a lid to seal up hell, which implies hell was once unsealed and mixing with the rest of the primordial world. Perhaps the excess that they had to put somewhere ended up going to the Dangai, which could explain why it functions under very distinctly different laws of time and space to every other dimension. Attributing reason to a being that governs over time and space is also a very interesting detail, especially when Thousand Year Blood War comes along and these kind of abstract, logic-defying hacks abilities become commonplace. Ichibei's Mausoleum of Skulls is one such ability. It steals the darkness from 100 of the Soul Society's knights 100 years in the future and imposes that darkness onto the present, showcasing Ichibei's control over concepts like time and space. As we have nothing suggesting the contrary, it's safe to assume that the Kototsu is a being that has served as the Dangai's cleaner since its creation a million years ago, and may just be one of the only other beings in the entire cosmos that actually outdates it like Ichibe. The Fullbringers are another byproduct of Reo's will. These are literally beings who, by some unknowable process, had a fragment of the Soul King intertwined with their souls. These fragments came from the Soul King's mutilation like the rest of his limbs and organs. The activation of Fullbringer powers happens in response to hollow attacks, which lines up with the Soul King being fundamentally opposed to Hollows. He was created almost as a response to the Hollows. We learned that the Fullbringers gain their powers because their pregnant mothers are attacked by Hollows and that has an influence on their souls. This is not exactly the case. While it is what happened to all the members of Execution, the source of their powers are not the Hollows, but the Hollows' greatest enemy, the fragment of Reo within them. As a potent source of Reiryoku, it attracts these Hollows whose Reatu makes contact with the Fullbringers' soul, thus activating their power. However, this doesn't
doesn't have to happen while they're in the wombs of their parents. Chad and Orihime, who are both Fullbringers, activated their own powers long after their births. For Chad, it was the hollow wound he sustained from Shrieker that activated his Fullbring, and for Orihime, it was the wound she received from Acid Wire, her brother Sora in the form of a hollow. Of course, the Hogyoku, the fact Karakura is a Jureichi, and Ichigo's own massive amounts of Reryoku were all factors that contributed to accelerating their supernatural power development. While some of Reo's body parts seem to have attained sentience and developed personalities of their own, I do believe his will persists in them all. The problem with trying to understand Reo's will is that it is clearly meant to be a ubiquitous yet ambiguous thing. Reo exists in everything. I thought it necessary to go over the basics of the world because if you think about it, as the soul king in a world where literally every single thing, including chairs and tables, have souls, the world of Bleach begins to make more sense. It is a soul pantheism, like this chapter title in Fullbring suggests. It's funny because the contents of that chapter and the explanation of the Fullbring power system would far better align with animism, but Kubo chose to go for pantheism, and the context of the Reo as the origin of all life makes it clear why. Everything is interconnected in some way, and the linchpin that creates this ever-present connection between absolutely everything is the Soul King. He is, in many ways, the universe. Why these foundations are so important to understand is because Kubo absolutely loves contrast. It is everything to him as a storyteller, aesthetically, structurally, and thematically. And so the connections between all these life forms adds a strong sense of cohesion to the massive cast of characters, despite their innumerable differences. Let me go a little deeper. Why is it that the powers in Bleach get progressively more broken and more abstract. It is no secret that Kubo uses abilities to inform us of the associated characters, but it's interesting how, as characters get more and more powerful, that is reflected in how ridiculous the nature of their abilities are. To alter the future, to turn imagination into reality, to reverse the events that have occurred between two targets, to disperse misfortune to those that have experienced good fortune, which is an entirely subjective thing by the way, and the ability to manipulate the lethal dose of any substance, even Reishi itself. Funny how all the ones I just mentioned were Quincy abilities. While every other life form has showcased incredibly hacks abilities in their own right, the Sternritter in particular are special, especially in the context of the final arc. Normal Quincy contain a small piece of Yuhaba within them, and by extension, a small fragment of the Reo's power. Sternritter contain a larger piece of Yuhaba within them, which brings them even closer to Yuhaba, Reo, or true Quincy's, if you will. This is what I believe Mayuri means in this quote from Can't Feel Your Own World when calling the Quincy's who received the divided power of the subspecies Yuhaba pure breed. We know that the Quincy of the Vandenreich in the Thousand Year Blood War are far different to the Quincy like Uryu who settled in the human world. The enemies of the Shinigami were in hiding within the shadow of the Seireite while the rest of the Quincy fled into different camps of their own that were mostly wiped out by the Shinigami 200 years before the current day, besides a few exceptions of course like the Ishida family, Masaki and the others that were being monitored by the Shinigami. At that point, the Quincy were a rare species, and by the time the story starts in chapter 1, Uryu believed himself to be the last Quincy, since his father had no interest in them and chose to live as a human, and that was the only other Quincy he knew of. We see him use techniques that no other Quincy utilizes. The base of their power is the same in the manipulation of Reishi, however they long abandoned the Let's Steel and took up the Vol Standing. They abandoned the relics of the past around 200 years ago, which interestingly lines up with the date we received for the Quincy extermination. Sorken rejected the progress and evolution the Quincy of the Vandenreich strove for, and that is why Uryu devises his self-sacrificial scheme to blow up the Vandenreich with the chips that were made with the same mechanism as the Sanrei Shuto, the glove that facilitates the lead steel that Sorken escaped the Vandenreich with. Uryu's entire storyline in the final arc is about carrying out the prophecy left behind by his grandfather about the enemy he must face, although since he was as a child at the time, this is a very vague mission that Uryu will have to decide for himself, and so ultimately by succumbing to this destiny, Uryu manages to find and embrace his own individuality, because of how these words from Sorken were left up for interpretation. 
Uryu had to decide for himself because Sorkin never explicitly told him. But we can say for certain that Sorkin and his philosophies that Uryu holds are very different to that of the Vandenreich and that the enemy he must face is none other than Yuha. That is why he escaped from them and took the Sanrei Shuto glove. It's very possible that Sorkin's entire reason for seeking a peace treaty with the Shinigami and to work together with them is because of his knowledge that Yuha will one day return to wage war upon them and destroy the world, creating a new world that Sorkin did not agree with. Yugaram's advice to Nanawa about the Kido she created says a lot about the Van der Reich's philosophy. It is one of mass production. While the lead steel is probably a far more effective weapon than the Volstandic, it's not refined and can only be used once. To be a cold, calculating and effective war force, they focus on refinement and sharing power between them to make as many powerful people as possible and guarantee victory. This is why they tread carefully and made several invasions. They are a smart, cunning and covert organization. Funnily enough, Yuhaba going against this as he descends into self-obsession and lunacy is one of the several factors that seals his fate at the end of the story. Nonetheless, there is a distinction made between the Quincy of Old and the Quincy of New, which is something I hope to explore a lot more extensively in the near future. The term subspecies is a very fitting description of Yuhaba as the son of Reo because that's what the Reo essentially is. He's not just one race, he is all of them at once. When you think about what the Reo's power was capable of, splitting the world into separate realms that is underpinned by a balanced cycle of Reishi with a relatively intricate design, all tied to spiritual matter, the Quincy being the faction closest to him makes even more sense. Their power has always been the manipulation of Reishi, and in the Thousand Year Blood War, we see this take form like never before. They can manipulate reality, which makes a lot of sense since reality itself is a Reishi construct. These really broken shrifts seem to have the ability to manipulate the properties of Reishi, in essence to bend the rules of reality to the user's will, which is how they can do things like create fire, lightning, induce fear through the optic nerves, or pierce through physical space itself. All of these impressive abilities are rooted in Reishi. When Lile Barrow shoots the Tree of Life, it feeds off the Reishi contained in his bullets. Even though his ability is technically spatial distortion and there are no actual bullets, there is still Reishi. With Reishi, the Quincy seemingly create things out of nothing, which once again is very appropriate for the people closest to the one who created the current world. Quincy can absorb, deconstruct, and reconstruct Reishi. They can manipulate its properties and interact with the matter in its pure state. Then we have the Fullbringers, who are very close to the Reo in their own right, and they have the power to manipulate the souls contained in all matter. In a sense, they reshape Reishi either by shape or density, and they can infuse their own soul onto it to tamper with the basic properties of whatever it is they are interacting with. Not so different from the Quincy powers at all. The Quincy showcase far more impressive feats, but we've only seen a few Fullbringers, especially in the manga. Within the novels, there's the case of Aura, who showcases the pinnacle of base Fullbring ability in the verse, and she literally refers to her powers as miracles. On top of this base ability that all Fullbringers possess, they have unique powers exclusive to them that comes from the fragment of Reo within them. These fragments intertwine themselves in the Kompaku of these Fullbringers by some unknowable means that is tied to the creation process of Kompaku, something we unfortunately don't know. There's always a connection between someone's power and someone's heart in Bleach, and this is best shown with the Fullbringers whose true power manifests when they develop attachments to certain objects that can function as conduits for their power, which is very similar to how the Zanpakuto are formed. Orihime's hairpin, Chad's skin, Riruka's dollhouse, Giriko's watch, Ginjo's cross, Ichigo's substitute badge, Tsukishima's bookmark, and so forth. These powers come from Reo, but they are also unique to the individual Fullbringer. The fragment within them is simply the impetus, the force that allows these reality warping abilities to manifest in a way that coincides with the soul it is intertwined with. Reo obviously doesn't have a hairpin that turns into six fairies, however he can do everything the fairies can. Again, this makes a lot of sense when you think about how transcendental and peerless the powers of the Reo were. They created the world, the life cycle, the laws of the universe, and they can be used to rewrite these laws as Yuhaba planned to do. Viewing the Quincy and Fullbringers side by side makes the mechanics surrounding both a lot easier to understand, especially since they're so similar. The Shinigami, despite being the ones to enforce balance in the cosmos, are the ones with the least connection to Reo. And if you think about it, this is well reflected in their powers. The 
Quincy and the Forbringer's powers are more physical, literal, and actualized, whereas the Shinigami almost have to make illusions in every area of their existences to convince themselves they're as close to reality as them. The Quincy are the actual children of Reo, literally connected to him either by blood or spiritually, whereas the Shinigami took the Reo, sealed him in a crystal, and have been brainwashed into revering him as a symbolic king who lies in heaven without ever being told the truth of his nature. It's almost like the Shinigami's powers unconsciously reflect this falsity they are built upon, with how they've been indoctrinated into worshipping Reo as their god, despite him having closer ties to their natural enemies. There's this line in chapter 520 of Bleach. Among the small number of scenes we have regarding the Soul King, this is the only one in the manga where he is directly attributed with some kind of personality. This is Kirinji's brief mention of Reo's obsession with Kurosaki Ichigo after having seen for himself how truly remarkable this guy really is. The scene takes place in the chapter immediately after Reo is physically introduced. Until this point, we have only ever known of the Soul King by name and he had only been explained to us in a single scene that takes place in chapter 223, the Scarlet Creation, wherein Aizen's true objective is outlined by Yamamoto. He intends to create his own Oken, a royal key that will give him access to the Reoku, a closed off dimension separate from the balance of the cosmos. With Can't Fear Your Own World context about Rangiku's Soul King fragment being the key ingredient for the Hogyoku's construction, her appearance on the cover page here makes more sense. In the same way, Karakura is essentially carved out of the human world and hidden in the outskirts of the Rukongai by the Shinigami, Aizen intended to create the Oken by killing the 100,000 souls present in the town which served as a suitable Jureichi, a concentrated spirit zone which would allow him to create the Oken himself. Chances are this would involve Aizen turning his own bones into the Oken through some kind of sacrificial ritual that creates this highly dense powerful substance that he maybe mixes with himself, I don't know the exact particulars, how the fuck they make the Oken we don't know, but when you think about it this isn't so different from the Hogyoku, and the cities in the royal palace, the ones belonging to each member of Squad Zero, very much imply that the process Aizen learned of to create his own Oken is the same one these Squad Zero members use themselves, which is pretty insane and almost hilarious to think about, especially with Senjumaru's line about Aizen's evil. He was literally following their footsteps, trying to turn Karakura into his own city in the sky. There are other examples of this phenomenon in Bleach where a lot of souls are merged together into this extremely dense object. We have the Asauchi, which are created by melding countless Shinigami souls together. We have White, the artificial hollow which was created by the same process, the Menos Grande are formed by melding countless hollow souls together, and of course the Oken and Hogyoku. This is something I need to think about a bit more, but if you have any ideas on what these connections may mean, please do share them in the comments, I'd love to hear what you guys think. The Shinigami, who have the least physical connection to Reo, at the same time share the most intimate connection with him in a very twisted way. He is only the Soul King because they made him so. He is only the cornerstone of the cosmos because they maintain that shape. And despite the fact that the people who built the Shinigami state committed a crime worse than murder, there are countless reasons to believe that Reo had plans for the Shinigami in the new world. The degree to which he is sentient and conscious is very tricky to quantify, but there are several reasons I believe it was his intention for the events of the Thousand Year Blood War to have taken the course they did. This page from chapter 612, with emphasis placed on Reo having seen the future overlapped on Ichibe and Ichigo, is worth noting. Later we have this panel where Yuhaba eggs Ichigo on to pull out his sword from Reo's chest and these words are placed in a panel with Reo's all-seeing gaze, almost as if he's the one egging Ichigo on to kill him. And then there's this quote from Ichibe in the third volume of Can't Fear Your Own World. I've spoken about this before but Reo's will is perhaps the biggest mystery in the series, one I think will remain as such as keeping him elusive and enigmatic only serves to benefit the story. We will probably get more about him in the future of the series whenever the hell arc comes around if balance is broken and needs to be restored or perhaps even reworked entirely, we can expect some lore on the first Soul King. But I'm certain we'll never get a clear answer on exactly what he believed, on exactly what the future he saw even was, because that would completely break the story in ways I don't think I even need
need to explain. That being said, the core details are important. I love the fact Can't Fear Your Own World explicitly explains the Soul King's dismemberment, although I do believe it's something Kubo had originally intended to be pieced together by the reader. The original sin is what made the current world. Reo facilitated the existence of Shinigami, Quincy, and Fullbringers, who variously integrate one of the Soul King's defining attributes into themselves. The clearest examples of this are how the Shinigami represent stagnation and the Quincy represent progress. All of these beings have a common origin, and that's what makes them all so similar. Small details distinguish them, but they are all fundamentally just souls. Even the hollows are basically just a mutation of the Kompaku in the opposite direction of the Shinigami. Speaking of the Shinigami, they are the most interesting to view from this angle because we're never told where their connection to Reo stems from, and they're also easily distinguishable from the others in the fact that their power is far less physical and more spiritual. They use the power from within. Their main tool is the Zanpakuto, which is literally a soul born from their own soul. I mentioned the Shinigami almost having to make illusions to make up for the areas where they are inferior to Quincy and Fullbringers. They are so driven by falsity in so many ways that this is even reflected in their powers. Yamamoto does not manifest fire. His Reiatsu is simply so hot that it appears like fire, despite reaching such ridiculously high temperatures that if it were actually fire, it shouldn't be visible at all. But with bad B, a Quincy, he can literally manifest real flames. It's almost like the Shinigami try to be like the Quincy, like they're mimicking them in some unconscious yearning to validate their connection to the Reo. All of these details come together to create this very messy world all rooted in the Soul King, and each race is not so different at all. At the end of the day, they're all humans, they're all Kompaku, which manifests in slightly different ways to reflect their representations and narrative roles. Shinigami, Quincy, Fullbringers, and Hollows are all competitive facets of the same underlying reality, which makes way for some incredible thematic writing. The Shinigami and Hollows, who use the power from within, have Zanpakuto, which functions like an extra limb, an instrument that is one with the user and serves as an extension of the self. The Quincy use the power from without. They form Reishi weapons. Their shrifts are literally just a manipulation of Reishi. They bend reality to their will. And lastly, the Fullbringers project the power from within onto an existing object to use their powers, some kind of combination of the two. These are some of the most blatant differences, but the most important thing I wanted to communicate in this video is the central underlying similarity between these beings, the soul. They are all beings who contain both ethereal and corporeal souls, and the former, the ethereal soul, or the heart as it's coined in the story, is what drives virtually every single thing in Bleach. In this world, willpower is literally everything and manifests as a physical force. The powers of Bleach make the inexpressible expressible by taking formless abstract things like feelings and emotions and turning them into literal physical things. Hollows are Kompaku whose chain of fate has completely corroded, causing them to burst into pieces that rearrange into a hollow. They gain a unique appearance and abilities that presumably line up with their hearts. For example, Grand Fisher's skin changing or Shrieker's leech. Shinigami are some kind of Kompaku mutation who draw power from their hearts, using the Zanpakuto as an extension of their souls, and they also have unique abilities that correspond with their identity, their heart. Fullbringers are Kompaku who contain a fragment of Reo that gives them the ability to manipulate matter once they develop an attachment to a certain object that can serve as a conduit for their powers, similar to Zanpakuto. And lastly, the Quincy, specifically the Stern Ritter with their shrifts. A very popular misinterpretation is that the shrift Shrifts, having been bestowed onto the Stern Ritter by Yuha, are a part of his own abilities. This is why you get people wondering why Yuhaba never used the Visionary, or any of the other very powerful Shrifts his Stern Ritter had. This is not the case. Shrifts are an innate thing that correspond with the respective Stern Ritter's identity. What Yuhaba provides is power in the form of Reryoku, through the piece of his soul he imprints onto them. Yuhaba's flashback makes this very clear. The soul piece he bestows onto others affects them in individual ways. An amputee gets their limbs back, someone sick gets cured, someone plagued by fear gains courage. Royd and Lloyd could imitate other people long before they met Yuhaba, which is proof that shrifts are an innate thing that are either activated or amplified by Yuhaba's soul piece depending on the context. There's also the fact that the Sternritter kept their shrifts after the Ashvalen but lost the power Yuhaba gave to them, which suggests that the actual power Yuhaba gave them comes in the form of their Volstandig. That would explain why every Volstandig is named the X of God, as 
offensive to say you have us fear, you have us love, you have us justice and so forth. And so just like every other faction, the power of the Quincy is determined by the heart and the heart is ultimately a product of Reishi which conforms to the laws of the universe. This is why so many of the most powerful characters within the narrative are those that adopt a scientific outlook towards these spiritual matters because everything is composed of spiritual matter which can be engaged with just like physical matter. The overall composition of Bleach's world is very coherent because it's ultimately just Reishi and the power to control, manipulate and understand Reishi is the key to everything. I think that's a good place to cut off this video which is less of a comprehensive analysis and more of a messy stream of facts and interpretations on Bleach's incredibly elusive lore and world building. There is so so much I could talk about and will talk about in the future so think of this as an introduction to various ideas I hope to explore to an even greater extent in the future. I hope you enjoyed and once again please leave any thoughts you have on the topic in the comments below because I'm incredibly interested to hear what you guys think and if there are any different interpretations to anything I said. Thank you guys very much for watching.